too many of us are too quiet about what we're seeing in our workplaces. We are going home and yeah, just sighing and thinking, okay, this is the way life is and it's only happening to me, but no, it's not. You are not alone. Hey, it's Nikki Llewellyn Gregory, and you're on Gut Plus Science. You're in for a fast-paced, storytelling, action item-rich leadership growth experience. I hope you make this podcast a habit. I consider it a leadership mentoring tool. Learning together makes us better together, and that is how we change the world around us. Let's get to it. Today's guest is building a global movement to prioritize psychological safety. That just fires me up speaking that out loud. Jessica Bench is an award-winning leader. Check out her LinkedIn profile for more on this awesomeness. She has spent years advancing DEI and employee engagement and currently spends a majority of her time with Roche as an agile coach. Jessica, welcome to Gut Plus Science. So excited that you're here. Why is your mission to build a global movement that advances psychological safety? I've got to hear the backstory here. Oh, yeah. This is a mission that has just gone down right into my bones, especially in the last five years. So five years I ago, I started a grassroots movement within my large um, company, a pharma, a pharma company. And we were just starting our agile journey. And the big leaders at the top were telling us, let's be more bold and more courageous, less consensus driven. And I thought, I received that. I'm going to do it. I I take you up on that invitation and essentially stood up on a stage in front of four to 500 of my peers. And I said, look, we have great values as a company, but sometimes there's a disconnect between what we say and what we do. And fundamentally, we need to look at how um, confident we are in terms of speaking up. And I want to start a group, a grassroots group, in order to tackle this. We've been struggling with speaking up for some time for many years, but maybe we can do it differently. And if you believe what I believe, I want to link arms with you. And so I said this to my peers and very quickly after the event, we had about 40, 50 people immediately sign up. Uh, We formed a core team. And over the course of of three years, we ran this movement on top of our day jobs. We uh, did global events and surveys and focus groups and talked to leaders at all levels and really created um, a platform and a place where more than 25,000 followed us and and what we were doing. And all through that time, I was thinking, this is a human topic. This goes well beyond the walls of this company, this country, this region of the world. This is a human topic. And I knew that because of the stories we were collecting. And so that's what kind of fueled me into thinking we got to go bigger. And especially, you know, with COVID and after COVID and a lot of topics around mental health and burnout and DNI, of course, I knew that a movement is needed in order to tackle these tough issues worldwide. And we need to do this together. So can I just say the power of speaking from a stage to whatever audience with influence is a big skill. It is one that everyone looks to do and the way that you just shared your Cliff Notes version of how you presented your case, I guess, for for asking people to come alongside and then the power in like, let's link arms to solve this. You really illustrated just awesomeness and and speaking from influence. So I just wanted to note that because this is a leadership podcast and how can we do that better? I think uh, we could probably learn a lot from you and maybe you'll come back to speak on that. So- I love that we're leaning into a topic that you're so passionate about. We do that on every episode. And I want to go a little bit deeper. And this is beyond just your workplace. You could speak into like what you found in your workplace, but then in the research that you've done also. So what are we overlooking as a society that's holding us back? I think we need to kind of start there because in order to achieve change in a movement, a listener sitting here like, hmm, what am I doing wrong? Like, what are the, let, let me do a self-assessment here. What is our workplace? Can we just kind of walk through what what is seen as the challenges right now? I love that question because it pinpoints exactly why I'm focusing on psychological safety. So what is happening in our world from what I can see is that we 
in, in a lot of change initiatives in, in companies, we focus on the leaders at the top. They receive all the coaching that they need, and it's kind of goes on behind closed doors. I think that's important, don't get me wrong, but there's a lot of focus on leaders. Then we have these topics around mental health. We have topics about, of course, diversity and inclusion. Um, we have burnout. We have so many of these type of topics are also floating around, but they're not connected. And what the research shows is that if you fundamentally look at psychological safety first, it is the foundation for success for any team or organization. All those other initiatives will then thrive. So psychological safety is the enabler for all these other initiatives to really take off and to thrive. Because what we're seeing in, in, in the world is maybe a little bit more checkbox exercises than actual tangible um, change in action. And that's why I have just really gone down to we need to feel free to express our thoughts in the workplace without fear. And how do we unlock that? In our mind, it's through a movement. I, I love that. And, and the question that's coming to mind for me right now is what does prioritizing psychological safety look like? The word is prioritizing if we're really doing it. And here's my like analogy. How many times do we have core values for our company that live on the walls or live on the website? But, and it's like, we have them, you know, we have a psychological safety plan, but what is it really bring it to life when, when a company and leaders are truly prioritizing it? Can you give us the vision for what that really looks like? Okay. So that to me looks like lived at all levels. And again, that sounds maybe fluffy. You could use that with values as well. But the difference being today, when we talk about psychological safety, many people are looking at it from an individual perspective. You know, I myself am in this situation. I don't know how to speak up. That's fine. It starts with individuals. But, and then there are a lot of people who talk about it from a team perspective. How do we create safe places for the teams in which we work? That's all good too, but what we're missing is the holistic perspective where it starts at the top and at the organizational level. So you need this to run in parallel by individuals receiving support, teams receiving support, and for organizations, to your question, what they need to do in order to prioritize is, this is going to sound dull, but I promise I'll give more color, um, is put in policies practices, rituals, processes in order to ensure that we can essentially have the eye-to-eye -eye conversations that we need to have. And it does start at the top. I know that we can easily write the words in a code of ethics or in a speak-up policy of sorts. That's the first place it starts. But in order for it to be prioritized at all levels, mechanisms, rituals need to be put in place for people to, for, to, you know, to start to open up the doors in order to lean into those hard conversations. Yes. And, you know, when you were saying starts at the top, one thing that comes to mind for me, and I'm curious how this resonates with you, modeling the way. So those at the executive level, the, the, when anything starts at the top, because we hear that phrase, what does that really mean? It really means that you're watching it be modeled out by those at the top. Do you agree? 100% agree. What I struggle with, and I think we all struggle with, is at times that's not being modeled at the top. Hence why we are in the situations we are today of so-called toxic workplaces. There is no accountability at all levels. And I was actually just speaking with somebody about this yesterday where she was saying organizations have no incentive today, generally speaking, to prioritize psychological safety. And they don't necessarily see the connection to the bottom line, or maybe they don't understand it. And, and I think today, psychological safety, yes, the term is being used more widely, it's maybe turned into a jargon, but I think through a movement, only then can we put the pressure, the attention that is needed at all levels of the organizations, but expect, especially um, at the top levels in order to 
um, put the attention, prioritization, measuring, monitoring that is needed. I meant to ask this before, but it, maybe it's just all in perfect timing. What is your definition of psychological safety? Yeah. So my definition is very simply um, feeling free to express my thoughts without a fear of a negative consequence. It's very simply leaning into those hard conversations. It's a must have in our relationships and in our organizations. I love the simplicity and that simple definition is very powerful. So let's talk about, um, you had said many workplaces don't have, or people don't have the incentives really to activate this. So let's bring to life what a psychological, psychologically safe workplace looks like, like really illustrating that we've been touching on it, but just really to give a clear picture, particularly tying in what does that look like when incentives are there and, and people are living this out and are rewarded for doing that and celebrated? So if I paint the picture first in terms of today, when we go into a corporate workplace, um, I had to learn this over time, but there's a certain understanding that certain language is used, maybe corporate jargon is used. You need to be very careful about how you show up how you express yourself, when to speak, when to not. That's, you know, in some ways is, is good. But there is the sense of I need to put on a mask when I go into the workplace. As opposed to in a true psychologically safe workplace, a psychologically safe workplace will have people who are asking the so-called, well, I was going to say dumb questions, but there's no such thing as a dumb question, <laughs> but asking the hard questions not feeling like they are marginalized for asking. Um, people are learning together. People are having, I like to think of it as this an analogy. Let me take a step to the side. It's like, you know, the children in the playground who have a good fight and then they go, they go back to playing together. It's something like this in the corporate workplace where we can have, you know, a good heated discussion but it's not personal because it is about the topics that we are talking about and still go back and know that all is well because we're in this together. We're focused on our mission together. And, you know, so no more of those corporate, quote unquote, games, whisper campaigns, gossiping rumors, these quiet things that go on behind the scenes. It's really having those open, open conversations at all levels, at all levels. That means there is no fear in knocking on the door, the virtual door of a leader that is two levels up and just having a straight conversation if you have ideas or, you know, um, something to share. So that's that's the vision, essentially. Gone are the days of like suiting up and putting on our alter ego to go to work, right? It's just... I, I'm going to say this out loud just because it is just who I am uh, to say this. And I'm in a psychologically safe space with you and our listeners. But people are running from corporate America. Yeah. Right? It's like not only is it harder for corporate America to attract talent because of the corporate America stigma of what we're talking about, but – I'll even put it out. I, I won't work for corporate America. Um, and I run a lot of times from doing business with corporate America because not just being a team member, but being a vendor to corporate America, it's like, I want to have real conversations and I'm really intentional with how I spend my life. And I don't want to look at my calendar and be like, oh gosh, this meeting, like, oh, I got to put on my, I got to go put on some extra makeup and I got to do my hair different for that. Like, it's just gone are the days of that. And so for leaders that, you know, it's like anything that is posture oriented, I got to posture, I got to play politics. Like it's got to go. Cause you're not going to, you're not going to be here pretty soon. Right. Do you want to rant with me for a minute before we talk about tactics? <laughs> <laughs> I, I love it. I love everything you're saying because you're absolutely right. When I think about our, our business today is that much more competitive. And if we aren't able to have the real conversations and, you know, it, it is also personal sharing as well. We don't need to like keep our our family lives, our personal lives, you know, to the side. It's really about bringing, you know, it sounds like a it sounds like a, a jargon again, but bringing our whole selves to work, it, it, it means in my mind, just you don't need to think twice about what you're saying. 
And I think in a lot of corporations today, too many of us do. And, and that puts an extra pressure on top of a very busy and stress-filled, you know, work life, an extra unnecessary pressure um, that just needs to be removed. I have people on my team that their focus is on unlearning because our culture is so different and they came from uh, corporate America. So I just wanted to throw this out for a second, whether it's a leader that is in their third decade of career or it's a person that has had one or two jobs that's been in the corporate world, we have to unlearn. It's, it's this, and it's really important because, you know, when you said, you said something that sparked this where we've been accustomed and we've learned this way. Our parents did this, our grandparents, right? And so it's really important to, to take time back and, and, unlearn it. Um, And so when I think about the word movement that I love so much that you're on this mission, this personal mission, and you brought so many people behind you, before we start talking about tactical efforts like policies and rituals and practices and stuff, movement. When you think of a movement, any leader that's trying to make change, this would be the most grandiose version, right? A movement. I want you to say, to break that down. What, what is that? What is a movement? So movement to me is when mass numbers of people are doing the same thing, saying the same thing in a steady drumbeat. That to me is what a movement is about. If you think about Me Too, Black Lives Matter, those are the you know two, two obvious big ones. How did that become the names that, that we all know today? It started because, well, because of some urgency of the situation and people were crying out together almost, you know, in, in short amounts of time, so many people were saying the same thing and then sharing their own stories as well. And that to me is what is needed. Too many of us are too quiet about what we're seeing in our workplaces. We are going home and, and yeah, just sighing and thinking, okay, this is the way life is and it's only happening to me, but no, it's not. We need to hear more of that, bring these more to the surface. It's not just about stories, but that's the first place. And let people know you are not alone. The experience that is happening in Switzerland is happening in America, is equally happening in in Asia. So um, this is a human experience and that will bring us together. Yes. All right. So let's do this. So we're going to break down some of these tactical ways. Like how, how do we do it? So I don't know where you want to start there, but I know you'd mentioned like policies in place or practices. I love the word ritual. So I just, I'm going to let you go and I'm going to play color with you. So I, I, I did mention before that we look at it from a holistic perspective, organizations, teams, and individuals. So I, I'll just start with individuals and teams before I get to organizations. For individuals, they need coaching. We all need coaching. We all could benefit from somebody who would spar and give us like new perspectives through conversation and and through questions to unlock whatever situation we are in. But that's not enough. Sometimes you really are in a toxic situation and you really don't know what to do. So then you go to the team level. In the team level, um, and this is where I put on my agile coach hat, There are many tactics or rituals that can be put in place for a team to set them up for success, such as setting up a team canvas when they first come together. What is your purpose as a team? What are your values as a team? What are our meeting rituals? What are, you know, the the practices that we want to come, you know, hold together that are as important to us as a team? So there are some practices that need to be done at this level. But if we talk about organizational level, that's where it becomes, in my mind, the game changer. Because let's say I am confident in myself as an individual to speak out and I feel safe in my team. But in this heavily networked world and in organizations, we have to not, we cannot overlook the organization level. Organizations that are open to prioritizing psychological safety starts with, as boring as it sounds, codifying it. (laughs) When you codify it, you need to communicate it. And when you communicate it, that means you need to have regular training and awareness. And when I say regular, I'm not talking about one workshop, one webinar, and that's it. It's like a yearly or bi-yearly message that is really ingrained for every employee 
you know, in the organization as well as any new organi- new employee that comes in. What else? Then what we need to do is create that transparency. So start looking at what are the mechanisms that we have in the organization that could unlock those hard conversations. I gave the example of the employee engagement surveys. If you unlock and un, you know make transparent those comments, imagine what conversations can erupt you know in in the hallways because we've given permission for the people. What else could we do? For example, exit interviews. Does your company even hold exit interviews as the first question? But second of all, if you do, what happens with those comments that are that you know when people leave? Why are people leaving? Why can we not make that more transparent? Of course, we protect the anonymity of those who are who, who are sharing. But that information is so important for us to uphold in companies. So that's one example in transparency. And then I'll move to collective accountability. Um, one example here is upwards feedback. So many of us go through performance review sessions at the end of the year. We have to get 360 feedback. How many of us are giving feedback, you know, upwards? And I know that sounds really scary to um, to give feedback, let alone one on one to to uh, a, a senior leader. But imagine if we were to do it in a group setting, you know, facilitated by you know a coach of or an agile coach or, or whatnot. We need to practice the art of um, speaking up or sorry, giving feedback. And, and, and that includes any level in the organization. My biggest point when it comes to Vanguard Voices is there are lots of interventions that need to be put in or could be put in. What we need to do is we need to try with a number of different interventions. We need to practice and then we can believe it. We don't need to do a lot of theoretical work. We just have to practice. And then we can learn the theory as we go, of course. You know, it starts to live in the hearts and minds of those who work there. And that's when collectively people say, no, this is the way we do business. This is the way we talk to each other because this is embedded in our day to day. And when you said collectively, I was just thinking about, okay, a movement coming together to be celebrated is when you start to see examples of the collective effort at the micro, meso, macro levels. Um, That's just like a beautiful vision of seeing it all come together. Love that. I know that you talk, we talked about accountability. You've touched on a couple of tools like employee engagement surveys, exit interviews, but I want to just have a quick conversation around measurement to make sure that we're, we're honing in on what is that Peter Drucker uh, quote about, um, what is, what is measured gets ma- managed or what isn't measured doesn't get managed, right? And so w- what does measuring this look like done well? And then how do you, you suggest like we celebrate the milestones or, or intercede? Just talk about measurement and accountability a little bit more. Yeah. And measurement to me goes very closely with the employee engagement surveys. And in the employment in, in employee engagement surveys, simply having one question on psychological safety. I feel safe to express my thoughts without fear. Rating it from one to five will already tell us a lot. And these engagement surveys need to be done fairly regularly in order to get the measurements or get the data that we need. But that question alone is really all that's needed and invite people to, 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 to add their comments. There are many different questions you can ask, like how, feel, how free do you feel in terms of learning. You can go into a certain level of detail. I personally believe in just asking that one single question. And if if organizations can show that we are taking action to that question, people will believe it and share that much more. And and you will see the numbers rise. I have seen it myself. Um, And so that's all that's needed. I love that. Thank you for honing back into the importance of simplicity. I think it's key to how we activate anything. We don't do things because they aren't simple. One thing I wanted to chime in on is I have a background working with employee engagement software and the like academic side of designing the right questions. And so I've been in that and, and had a lot of learnings. And one thing that I wanted to share is the importance of the regularity. I love how you said it might be this one question that is that is straight up like 
this is how we measure this. This one question. I love the simplicity of that. The regularity of asking is really important because we found in many case studies, there is one day, one minute in time that can throw off that response. One meeting with one leader that can throw that off. And if you don't address it close to the time that that happens, now we're talking about one person and we know like many companies have thousands and thousands of people and we want to be able to give everyone their unique experience. But if you just think this is just a really loud example of one person in one moment with one leader, one day of change significantly changing their answer. Now we can't, we can't survey every day, but the point is that changes happen really fast. So If you're doing this once a year, it's not going to cut it. Like the regularity is very important. So, you you know, you can't check the the box on measuring and say, we've got the one a year. What I'm saying is you really, and maybe lean into Jessica to ask some questions with that because there's an importance of the cadence for sure. 100%. And continuing the conversation even in between the the issuing of of those um, surveys. I truly think that that's, those kind of conversations are most effective, um, especially at the team level. You're in it together. It's important. And we want to see see change. And you're that much more powerful. So Jessica, this has flown by. And I love this conversation. Before we head over to our lightning round, I want to ask if someone's listening right now, and let's say that they're either at a place that they're thinking, I have so much work to do on this and I'm ready, but I got so much work to do. Or for someone that's listening and says, we've got a good start, but we got a lot of work to do. If you were to say the one thing that I suggest that you lean into to really advance the ball, there's lots of, lots of components, but this overarching, this is going to help you move it forward and, and see the greatest impact. Like what is your one thing? If you're not the leader of the company, talk to your leaders and ensure that this gets on the agenda. Awesome. This has been so fun. I love the conversation. I love your passion. We're going to dive into our lightning round. So the first one is your favorite book of all time or a favorite recent read we add to our ever-growing recommended reading list. What book would you put on there? So the book I'm currently reading, which is an absolute must for everyone who's in this space, is by Stephen Shedleski, The Speak Up Culture. He's a partner of ours, so I'm going to give a big shout out that, yes, go, go follow Shed Stuff and read that book, Speak Up Culture. Jessica. Take us back to Jessica in her 20s. I was a lot more bold than I am today. And bold in terms of taking a a lot of uh, high adrenaline activities under my wing. So I've jumped out of a plane by myself. I jumped with an instructor. I've done paragliding. I've done pan gliding. I've done whitewater rafting in four different parts of the world. If you ask me to do that today... (laughs) <laughs> I would be shaking my head so furiously. I think I got it out of my system in my 20s. And um, I'm quite, quite happy that I at least adapted that and did that. Yeah. How fun. And as we get older, we're like, um, I really do need to still be on this earth to help with X, Y, and Z. So yeah, exactly. I, I've, I've been in that boat as well. Um, but do kind of miss the idea of going and jumping out of another plane too, because dang, the adrenaline rush is something. Yes. Okay. Next question. Which influencer, quote unquote, author, speaker, whatever, fires you up, like lights your soul? There is nobody else right now than Bishop T.D. Jakes. His weekly sermons feed my soul like nothing else. And I just so appreciate him. He puts his every ounce of fire in every word. Sometimes I'm like, I'm sitting here praying for this guy that he does not have a heart attack because he has given us his all. He is he is awesome. Well, Jessica, before we go, I'd love to help people connect with you, to stay in touch, ask you a question, whatever. What are the best ways for them to, or what is the best way for them to connect with you after this? So they can connect with me definitely over LinkedIn as well. um, Follow our uh, Vanguard Voices website so they can sign up through our email distribution there. We have a Speak Up Summit coming up in June. People will definitely want to be part of this. It's going to run over 24 hours and 50 plus speakers. So that's to us is a particular milestone that I want to highlight that people will probably want to join Um, because we're going to be starting to catalyze those global actions uh, for this movement together. 
Oh, Jessica, you brought it today. Such a powerful topic on building a global movement for psychological safety. I love getting behind somebody's passion. Here's my truth you can act on from our conversation today. Number one, psychological safety is the enabler for all things to work. Psychological safety is feeling free to express my thoughts without a fear of negative consequence. Number two, it all starts at the top with psychological safety. Leaders at the top have to be living that out. So it has to be macro level, mezzo, and micro all flowing together, but it starts at the top and we have to model the way. Number three, speak up. No more being quiet. You're not alone in what you're thinking. And to be able to share those things and feel freely, you got to practice it. So practice speaking up. Number four, each team member needs values practice with rituals to enable people to feel safe and to speak up. So what are the rituals and the values on your direct team, outside of the whole company, your team, your values, your rituals? Number five, transparent feedback is two-way feedback. Leader, team member, back and forth, feedback. Number six, measure psychological safety via employee engagement surveys with limited questions, standardized regularly. An example is having one question related to psychological safety every single time that you're pushing out that employee engagement survey. Same question, a regular cadence, and you're able to then measure against your baseline and watch the progress. From there, at the team level, ask open-ended questions so that you get feedback on how do we improve? What are the how ideas, the hows we improve? We want to hear your feedback. So with that, y'all, we'll see you next time. We just left the world a little bit better. Now, go do something with it.